This cavernous hall in central India was painstakingly carved out of solid rock more than a thousand years ago. Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain monks used to meditate here, hidden away in the shadowy chamber. They practiced a variety of meditation techniques, but for the most part, they all strive to achieve a state of transcendence, a state of ecstasy, a state of absorption that the rishis, the sages of ancient India, called samadhi. Throughout history, many have engaged in meditative and contemplative practices, seeking transcendent or ecstatic experiences. The word ecstasy comes from the Greek ekstasis, to stand outside, which means to escape the bounds of the material world, to break free from human limitations, and to reach a reality that's said to be transcendent or supreme. Amongst Christians, there were great mystics like Dionysius, Meister Eckhart, and John of the Cross, who didn't merely cultivate faith in God, they sought the actual experience of being in God's presence, in a state of divine union, a state of ecstasy. They practiced a type of mysticism in which they emptied their minds of all activities, all thoughts, concepts, and ideas, even the idea of being oneself. In that sheer emptiness, they discovered that God alone remains. Dionysius said, leave behind you everything perceived and understood everything perceptible and understandable. And with your understanding laid aside, strive upward as much as you can towards union with him who is beyond all being and knowledge. Meister Eckhart said, if a man will turn away from himself and from all created things, by that you will be made one and blessed in the spark of the soul, which has never touched either time or place. John of the Cross said, to arrive at possessing everything, desire to possess nothing. To arrive at being everything, desire to be nothing. To arrive at knowing everything, desire to know nothing. Amongst Muslims, the Sufis engaged in whirling dances and rhythmic chanting called dhikr to enter into a state of trance. Then, with their minds emptied of all worldly concerns, they could become reunited with the Beloved, as they say. Rumi, the great Persian poet of the 13th century, wrote, Lose yourself. Lose yourself in this love. When you lose yourself in this love, you will find everything. In India, many practitioners are guided by the teachings of Patanjali, the author of the famous Yoga Sutras. Patanjali taught that yoga is citta vritti nirodha, the practice of bringing all mental activities to a complete stop. Each of the spiritual traditions we've just discussed stressed the importance of letting go of thoughts, emptying your mind, and relinquishing attachment to worldly pleasures and their differing practices all lead to the same goal, to break free from human limitations and reach the state of transcendence. I too was inclined to seek transcendental experiences even as a child. I remember a lovely spring day 
when I was lying down on a lush carpet of grass with my eyes closed. The sun's warmth seemed to hug me like a cozy blanket. The intoxicating fragrance of lilac bushes nearby wafted in the gentle breeze. The intensity of all those sensations overpowered me, pushing aside all my childish thoughts and immersing me in a state of blissful absorption. Years later, while hiking through California's rugged mountains, with each step, my mind would gradually drop its concerns about my job, home, friends, and everything else. Eventually, my mind would fall into a state of deep silence and remain absorbed in the exquisite beauty all around me. I should mention that in the late 1960s, when hippie culture was at its peak, I experimented with mind-altering drugs like LSD. Such drug use is generally unadvisable, but in my naive and reckless way, I was seeking the same transcendence that I found lying on the grass or hiking in the mountains. Later, I learned yoga and meditation which ultimately led me to undergo formal training under the guidance of a traditional guru. All this spiritual study and practice was driven by my burning desire for transcendence. So, we might ask, why is it that people seek transcendental experiences? Why aren't we all content simply with the joys of everyday life? According to the ancient rishis, your true nature is divine, perfect, an abode of limitless peace and uninterrupted contentment. So, whenever you undergo any kind of suffering, that suffering is contradictory to your true nature. Suffering is incongruous with your innate fullness and perfection. It's unnatural, in a manner of speaking. So, to experience transcendence is actually to cast off the defect of suffering and return to your true divine nature. Transcendence, or ecstasy, is a state of inner freedom, a state of being utterly free from the problems of life and the limitations of your body and mind. This state is called moksha in Sanskrit. Moksha literally means liberation or freedom. Not merely freedom from rebirth, but a state that transcends any kind of suffering, limitation, or imperfection. The spiritual path to gain moksha was revealed by the rishis in the Upanishads, the ancient scriptures often called the epitome of Hindu philosophy. The 2,000-year-old Mandukya Upanishad is the shortest of all the Upanishads, yet it's one of the most profound. It explains how the sacred syllable Om is to be used for meditation. This one-syllable mantra is unique in its capacity to lead us beyond all mundane experiences, beyond our bodies and minds, beyond all words and concepts, to reach a state of utter transcendence. Om isn't like any other word or name. Properly understood, Om is a symbol, but not a visual symbol like a nation's flag or a company logo. Om is a sound symbol, a symbol that's audible, spoken or heard. As a symbol, Om represents the supreme transcendent reality the reality called Brahman. The rishis taught 
that Brahman is the underlying reality because of which everything in the world exists. For the universe, Brahman is like the clay because of which this pot exists, or the threads because of which this cloth exists. Brahman is the very fabric of existence. The Mandukya Upanishad begins with the Rishi's representation of Brahman using the syllable Om. Om iti etad aksharam. The syllable Om, idam sarvam, is all this, all that exists, the entire universe. Tasya, about that syllable Om, Upavyakyanam. Here is a teaching, an explanation of how Om is to be used in meditation. Sarvam, all that exists, Bhutam Bhavat Bhavishyadati, in the past, present, and future, Omkara Eva, is the syllable Om alone. Yet Chanyat, and anything else, trikalatitam, that lies beyond the past, present, and future, tadapi, that also, onkara eva, is the syllable om alone. Sarvam hi etat, all this, the entire universe, is Brahman, the supreme transcendent reality the fabric of existence. Like this pot is just a form of clay, the entire universe is understood to be a form or manifestation of Brahman. Now the Rishi shifts away from this ultimate perspective, that of Brahman, and turns to a personal experiential standpoint. He does so by explaining that Brahman is I am Atma, your own true self, your essential nature. Atma is the consciousness that makes you a sentient, awareful being, the consciousness by which you know all your thoughts, emotions, and sensations. According to the Rishis, that very consciousness is your divine inner nature the limitless abode of peace and contentment. The true divinity of your consciousness might not be fully known or recognized by you, so its extraordinary nature is carefully unfolded in the following verses. The Rishi explains that consciousness makes you aware of all your experiences, experiences that take place either when you're awake, while you're dreaming, or in deep, dreamless sleep. Due to your conscious nature, you become the observer or awareful witness of whatever happens in the waking state, the dream state, and in deep sleep. These three states of experience come and go, whereas you constantly observe them as they arise one after another. Even the experience of deep sleep is observed by you. It's like standing in a perfectly dark room with your eyes wide open. You see, but there's nothing to be seen. In this way, you are the ever-present observer of the three constantly alternating states. And with reference to waking, dream, and sleep, you, as the observer of the three, are considered the fourth. The Rishi explains, Soyam Atma, that Atma, your essential nature as consciousness, Chatushpat, has four components, waking state, dream state, deep sleep, and conscious observer. The three states are transient. They come and go each day. But the fourth is not transient. It's the constantly abiding, awareful witness of the three. 
Traditional teachers of Vedanta are quick to point out that the fourth cannot be a fourth state of experience. Every state of experience is transient, whereas the fourth is ever-present. All experiences, without exception, take place when you're awake, dreaming, or in deep sleep. Meditative and transcendent experiences, like samadhi, take place in the waking state, assuming, of course, that the meditator hasn't fallen asleep. Now, to understand the relationship between these three states and the conscious observer, we'll need to explore one of the most profound teachings of the ancient rishis. They discovered that everything you experience actually occurs in your mind. Your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and skin receive information about the world around you and convey it to your mind where it becomes known to you, the conscious observer. When Om is chanted aloud, its sound travels through the air and reaches your ear, striking your eardrum. Then, as a result of tremendously complex networks of nerves and neurons, an Om sound arises in your mind and becomes known to you. You might remember learning that sound can't travel through empty space. It needs a medium through which it can travel. Usually, that medium is air. Air is crucial because sound is actually waves of compressed air, waves that spread outwards from the source of the sound until they reach your eardrum and get converted into the sounds you hear. Based on this, we can say the sound OM begins as waves of air. Those waves travel through the air and eventually dissipate as the sound OM fades away into silence. It's much the same for the sounds inside your mind. The sound OM arises in your mind not as waves of air, but as waves or vibrations of consciousness vibrations that you experience as sounds. In the teachings of Vedanta, those waves or vibrations of consciousness are known as vrittis, or mental events. The vrittis produced by a sound arise like a wave and vibrate in your consciousness until the sound fades away into silence. So, just as air is the medium through which sound travels. Consciousness is the medium in which vrittis arise, even though consciousness isn't a material substance like air. A wave of water is made of water. Sound, which is a wave of compressed air, is made of air. And a vibration in your consciousness, a vritti, is made of consciousness. Every sight, sound, smell, taste, or touch that arises in your mind is a vritti made of consciousness. Your thoughts and emotions also arise in your mind as vrittis. They too are made of consciousness. And all this is true not just when you're awake, but for your dreams as well. The people, buildings, cars, and things you experience while you're dreaming are vrittis made of consciousness. Then, in deep sleep, all these vibrations come to an end. Vrittis all fade away, and the only thing left in your mind is pure consciousness. The final conclusion of the rishis is nothing short of amazing. Everything you experience in waking, dream, and deep sleep is made of consciousness. In fact, it's nothing but consciousness. And you 
as the awareful observer of the three states, are also consciousness, the very same consciousness. So, in every experience, there is only consciousness, consciousness alone. This, indeed, is the profound truth of Advaita, or non-duality, the loftiest teaching of the ancient rishis. Now, since consciousness is not a fourth state of experience, and since experience itself is nothing but consciousness, then why did the composer of the Supanishad say that consciousness is the fourth component of Atma? Consciousness is not the fourth in addition to your three states of experience. Rather, it's the underlying reality because of which the three states exist. Look at this again. Instead of four parts, there's one underlying reality because of which the three states exist. Waking, dream, and deep sleep are just forms of consciousness, like waves are forms of water, or sounds are forms of air. The three states are parts of one whole, and that one whole is called the fourth, with reference to the three parts. Now, in the next part of the Upanishad, the Rishi associates these four, waking, dream, sleep, and pure consciousness, with the syllable Om. He does so by dividing Om itself into four parts. How can you get four parts out of a single syllable? Well, the vowel O can be grammatically deconstructed into A followed by U. So then we have A, U, and Ma. But what about the fourth part? Remember that Om is a sound symbol. And when you repeat it as a mantra, there's a gap after one om ends and before the next one begins. So, the four parts of om are a, u, ma, and the gap of silence between repetitions. By the way, it's absolutely incorrect to write om like this. It actually violates rules of Sanskrit. Om is represented here as ah-u-ma uh, to introduce a particular meditation technique, not for the sake of writing or pronunciation. In this meditation technique, a uh, represents your waking state, u uh, represents your dream state, and ma uh, represents your experience of dreamless sleep. The gap of silence between repetitions of Om represents pure consciousness. Each time you chant Om, A is followed by U, and U is followed by Ma. The sequence of sounds represents your daily experience in which the waking state is followed by dreams and deep sleep. The repetition Om Om, Om, represents your experience day after day, as the three states come and go, one after another. And the gap of silence represents pure consciousness, the consciousness that's the underlying reality because of which the three states exist. The Rishi describes this consciousness as a drishyam, imperceptible, avyavaharyam, non-relational, agrahyam, ungraspable, alakshanam, indefinable, achintyam, unimaginable, and avyapadeshyam, inexpressible. Because consciousness is the awareful observer, 
the knowing subject, it can never be an observed object. And because consciousness isn't an object, it has no shape or color, no size or weight, no qualities or attributes whatsoever. And since consciousness has no qualities or attributes, it can't be described like an object. Yet, even though consciousness cannot be described in this way, it's immediately present in all your experiences as a gatma pratyaya saram, the consciousness present in every experience, the awareful medium in which every vritti vibrates. Further, that consciousness is prapancha upashamam, eternal, existing before the world and after its end. That consciousness is shantam, peaceful, content, tranquil. And it is shivam, pure, holy, auspicious. Consciousness is the divine presence within you. Finally, that consciousness is advaitam, non-dual. It's the one underlying reality because of which your three states of experience exist. That consciousness, chaturtam manyante, is called the fourth, sa-atma. That is your true self, your essential nature. sa Vignayaha, that is to be known, to be discovered, to be realized. Wow, I have studied this passage many times, but I still get a thrill when I read it. The Rishi says, Atma, your true nature, has to be discovered. It has to be realized. So, the ultimate goal of meditating on Om isn't to merely enjoy a transcendental experience. The goal is to realize your true nature as eternal, pure, non-dual consciousness. An experience that comes and goes without producing an insight can never lead you to moksha, liberation, no matter how profound or ecstatic it might be. If sheer experience were enough, I would have become enlightened as a child lying on the grass. Yet, transcendent experiences are indeed crucial because they can create an opportunity for you to discover what the rishis discovered. And when you have realized your essential nature to be eternal, pure, non-dual consciousness, then all suffering comes to an end. Now we can turn to the specific meditation technique taught in this text. It's not an introductory technique, so we'll assume that you've already mastered the basic skills of meditation. Also, unless you're an advanced meditator, it might be helpful to begin by reciting the syllable OM aloud at first. Then, after your mind has become stable and established on the mantra, recite OM mentally concentrating on its sound in your mind, on the vritti that arises and fades away with each repetition. This practice needs to be performed with tremendous diligence and patience until all distractions recede from your mind and your attention remains completely one-pointed, focused exclusively on the sound Om. When your attention has become firmly fixed in this manner, then you can gradually lengthen the repetitions 
like this. Om. Om. With enough effort and practice, you can eventually reach a state of deep absorption in this way. And then you'll be ready to begin the process of contemplation prescribed in this Upanishad. As the sound a uh, merges into u, contemplate on being the conscious observer of the waking state as it merges into dreams each night. As the sound U merges into Ma, contemplate on being the conscious observer of the dream state as it merges into deep sleep each night. Then, as the sound Ma trails off into silence, contemplate on being the conscious observer of all three states as they come and go, day after day, throughout your life. Finally, in the gap of silence, contemplate on your true nature being eternal, pure, non-dual consciousness. That's the ever-present observer of the constantly alternating states of waking, dream, and sleep. The purpose of this meditation is to help you more fully appreciate your inner essence as pure consciousness, eternal and transcendent, beyond suffering of all kinds, remaining unscathed even by the most terrible events in life. Consider this. Air isn't fundamentally affected by the sounds that travel through it. Sound compresses air into waves, but all the minute molecules in the air remain unchanged. When a sound arises, whether it's the sacred syllable OM, or the deafening explosion of a terrorist's bomb, or the laugh of a little child, the air through which these sounds travel remains unchanged. So too, your consciousness isn't fundamentally affected by anything you experience. Pleasure and pain, happiness and sadness, great joy and dreadful grief, all these arise as vrittis, vibrations of consciousness and those vibrations don't alter the nature of your consciousness in any way whatsoever, like sound waves don't alter the nature of air. Your consciousness remains untainted, flawless, the abode of limitless love, peace, and contentment. This is the discovery of the ancient rishis. The rishis who left us a road map, so to speak, in the Mandukya Upanishad and other texts to help us discover what they discovered.